Assalamualaikum and good greetings. So today we'll be watching a video titled Christian Reads the Quran Episode 4. This is by Dex Van der Well. We have watched um, and react to the three first episodes. This will be the fourth one. Without further ado, let's watch. What's up everyone? My name is Dax. If you haven't seen this channel before, if you haven't seen me before, uh, it's nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a Christian and I'm currently doing a series where I'm looking at the Quran, the Holy Book of Islam. I'm reading it from front to back and I'm doing a series uh, going straight through. So this is episode four where we're going to cover surahs, surahs 10, 11, and 12. Uh, that's what we're going to look at. So uh, last week we looked at surahs 7, 8, 9. In each surah, we're talking about a few things that stick out to me. As I read the whole surah, there's a few things that I'm interested in, that intrigue me, that are different from Christianity and Islam or, or similar or the same. So overall, I'm comparing and contrasting the two largest religions in the world, Christianity and Islam. And that was really my goal in this series. I want to learn about Islam. I want to meet some Muslims. I want some Muslim friends so that we can have conversation. Oh yeah, I have commented on the previous video and I think he have responded. I haven't covered that one yet. So after this, we will go to that one, I think, because he did explain something with regard to my question. That would be the next video. I forgot about that. Conversation so that we can challenge each other with the truth and hopefully push each other closer to the truth, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so last week we talked about Surah 7, and I talked about Surah 7, 157, which says that Muhammad is prophesied about in the Bible. It's telling the Jews and Christians that they will find Muhammad in the Torah and Gospel that they have with them. So that the Jews and Christians should be able to go to the Torah, go to the Gospel, and they should be able to see Muhammad prophesied about there. So I asked you guys, what is the best prophecy in your mind? Where do you see Muhammad prophesied about in the Bible, in the Torah, in the Gospel, etc.? Uh, and there were a few different answers that came up consistently. One was a lot of people pointed to Isaiah 42. Uh, I, I fully admit that's the one that I studied the least, so I really don't have an opinion on it yet. I need to study it a little bit more. Some people pointed out Deuteronomy 18.18. Some people pointed out Song of Solomon 5.16 and said Muhammad is in there. So I just wanted to respond quickly to, to a couple of these. First of all, I will say this. Uh, I watched a video by Shabir Ali. One of you posted a video by Shabir Ali. He's a famous Islamic thinker, a brilliant man. I totally admit that. He's very, very smart. But Song of Solomon 5.16 is not talking about Muhammad. It's just not. Like, I, I knew it wasn't, but I still studied it, and I looked at the Hebrew word a little bit, deep, little bit deeper. I tried to understand where he was coming from. But Song of Solomon 5.16, is, it's just not talking about Muhammad. First of all, um, the word there is it's not even pronounced like Muhammad. The way that he pronounced it is Muhammadin, which sounds like Muhammad. So some people are like, oh, it's, it says Muhammad. The problem is, is that Hebrew, the transliteration of that word is actually pronounced Mahmud, Mahmud, Mahmud. So Mahmud doesn't even sound like Muhammad in the first place. So this word, it doesn't really sound like the name Muhammad. Not only that, but it doesn't have the same name. Does it not? Some people were saying, it should have been translated praised one, which is what Muhammad means in Arabic. But that's that's not true. That's not what this Hebrew word means. It's pronounced Mahmud, and it means um, some sort of desire, beauty, that sort of thing. But it, it doesn't mean praised one. So this Hebrew word, it's not. it doesn't have the same meaning as Muhammad. It doesn't have the same sound as Muhammad. It's, it's just not. It's not talking about Muhammad. So unless I'm missing a really big part of this argument, Song of Solomon 5.16, also in context, it's talking about someone's lover. It's talking about a couple who's in love with each other. That's what the whole book is about. So... To say that this is talking about Muhammad, uh, I, I, I don't think it's a very good argument. So, Anyway, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the topic. I have watched and reacted to one video, I think, um, that pointed out, I think, is it in Isaiah or something? No, I, I don't remember. Um, that, you know, but I think because the, the, the point that the video talked about is similar to what he's saying here about you know, um, the word in Hebrew, is it in Hebrew uh, or in Aramaic? I'm not sure. Um, that That is basically the same uh, like the Arabic because both are Semitic language, right? Mim ha mim dal, that's Arabic version. So it says that it's the same, etc, etc, etc. So I'm not sure whether this is the same verse that I watch or not. I will say this. I think Deuteronomy... Um, I will say Deuteronomy 18.18 is probably the best argument or the closest one that I could see could potentially be talking about Muhammad. But I still think you have to stretch the text a little bit. Like the natural, the natural interpretation of Deuteronomy 18 is that it's talking about a fellow Israelite. And we know that from the rest of the book. It, it talks about fellow brethren. And so Muslims will say, well, fellow brethren, that could be um, uh, an Ishmaelite because he's the brother of, of, you know, that sort of thing. But the problem is that when, when this author, the author of Deuteronomy, when he says fellow brethren, he's used that elsewhere to refer to fellow Israelites. He says you need to get a king from your fellow brethren. And he specifies, I'm obviously not talking about a foreign king, like one of you. So elsewhere in the book of Deuteronomy, he says fellow brethren, and he means fellow Israelites. And so he says in Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, he says, 
uh, a prophet is going to rise from you and from your fellow brethren. So naturally, I think the best interpretation is that it will be an Israelite. Um, could you say that, could you try to argue and stretch that to mean an Ishmaelite and someone who's not an Israelite? I think you could try, but I don't think, I just don't think it's the natural interpretation of the text. And we need to be careful when we're stretching things a little bit. I will say this though, one thing I learned is that I said Muhammad never talked to Allah face to face. He never had any direct communication with him, but it does change because of the night journey. You guys told me about the night journey. Um, I, I read briefly about it, but Isra and Mirage and the night journey. So basically Allah or uh, Muhammad during his time here on earth, I think this was early in his life or earlier in, in the Mecca period, he went up to heaven and then experienced this is actually the later part of the Mecca period, the Isra and Mi'raj. Uh, year 10, is it? Because it's close to, um, you know, Hijrah already. These different levels of heaven, and then eventually had contact with Allah or had a conversation with him or something. So I think it's referenced in the Quran, but then the Hadith, the Hadith probably give more details about what that looked like. Um, so, so if you say that, okay, yeah, but Deuteronomy 18, 18 could be talking about Muhammad because Muhammad did have a face-to-face -face interaction with, uh, with Allah. That could be interesting. I still don't think, I still don't see that it's the natural, like, understanding of Deuteronomy 18, 18, but uh, I will look more into it. I will continue to study that one. Also, I, I do need to study Isaiah 42 more because some people said that was talking about Muhammad. So I'll look at it. Besides that, uh, Surahs 8 and 9 of episode 3, um, I talked about Islam being a religion of peace or not. And so I asked the question, when is Islam a religion of peace? Oh, yeah. So my comment is with regard to this one. My question to him, whether he think uh, uh, he can consider the religion from God um, should or naturally would cover the level of you know how you run a state etc or just individual level um, and I think he's responded and yeah again that's what that would be the next video and uh, and the responses was mostly yes Islam is not it's a religion of peace, but it's not a pacifist religion because there is, especially in the early history of Islam, there's, there are a lot of wars, there are a lot of battles. Um, and so uh, specifically in, in Surah 9, it's... Actually, it's the later part of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mission. Um, but if you want to see Islamic history from a zoomed out perspective of 1,400 1, years, then of course, it, it's, you can consider it's early, right? Surah 9 verse 4, it's talking about there was a violation of a peace treaty, and so that led to some violence. I still don't know that that applies to verse 29. I don't know if that is still talking about the treaty that was violated, but that, again, that's for another video uh, where I'll talk exclusively on this topic. Um, also, I think the biggest problem, when you're talking about is Islam a religion of peace, is it a religion of war, I think you have to study the life of Muhammad to really understand what he exemplified, and I just don't have that knowledge. I haven't read a biography on him, and I haven't looked into a lot of the Hadiths, so I'm not totally sure what that looks like. But if you really not want to know if, if Islam is a religion of peace or not, I think you have to look at the life of Muhammad and ask uh, what, what were his actions actually showing. And so um, I will look forward to doing that in the future. With that being said, let's hop into episode four. Make sure to drop a like and subscribe. I know that was a long recap, but I think it was necessary. And I think you guys want to know what I'm learning as well. So we can try with each other. All right, Surah number 10. So as usual, I'll be looking at my, you know, Quran in the, the handphone to refer to the verses that he's talking about. So while... Surah number 10. So, Yunus, Yunus, I know I'm over-exaggerating it a little bit. Yunus uh, means Jonah in Arabic. So this is, it's not all about the story of Jonah, but Jonah is referenced in verse 98. And so the surah, uh, it most likely comes from the early Meccan period. Oh yeah, so I think, because he'd make the remark, which is interesting. I think in the Bible, there are, is it books or chapter that is about specific prophets? Correct me if I'm wrong. So, in, in, in the Quran, the name of the surah, there, there will be the name that is referring to the name of certain prophets. Uh, there's a surah Maryam, there's a surah, uh, etc., etc., right? Al-Baqarah, etc. So, it doesn't imply that the whole surah will be about that, right? Because normally the name of the surah in the Quran is referring to a, a unique item or story in the surah right so it's identified as that because that's the unique part of the surah for example the surah an-naml uh, an-naml is just the the verse is just one verse that said that that episode happened prophet sulaiman or solomon uh, you know cross paths with the 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 naml right the the ant there's no focus there but because that is unique to that surah so when uh, the surah is referred to as an-nam people will know, oh, that, that surah, right? So the, the function of the naming is different. It's not 
to give an idea of the surah is fully about that. Of course, there's a uh, one or two surah that as that is as such, like for example surah Yusuf, right? But most of the for for most of the part, um, it's it's different. Um, the first thing that stuck out to me in the surah is simply this question: What is the purpose of life in Islam? I think everyone, no matter what their worldview is, at one point asks this question: What is the purpose of life? What is the point to life? What should I be doing while I'm alive here on earth? What is the end goal? And I think from the surah, there were a couple of verses that stuck out to me that break down the point of life. First of all, surah 10, verse 56, talking about Allah, he gives life and causes death, and unto him shall you be returned. So we see this idea that is very consistent, like we, we were created, but we're separated from Allah, we no longer serve him, but we should return to him. That's sort of the... So just going through the verse, right? A'udzubillah minash shaitan rajim. Huwa yuhyi wa yumit wa ilayhi turja'oon. Huwa yuhyi wa yumit. He is the one that gives you life and and uh, cause you to die or you know wa ilayhi turja'oon and to him you will return. System like we, we were created but we're separated from Allah we no longer serve him but we should return to him that sort of But he what he's saying is imposing the Christian ideology we are separated from God. Uh, that is not mentioned in the verse. Allah just said Allah is the one that gives you life and give you death and you will return to him it does not not it's not the idea of you are together with god and then somehow separated and you're coming back it's not that it's you are being given life and you being given death and then you will return to god you know in the here after sort of, that's sort of the end goal not only that but in verse 25 it calls heaven the abode of peace and in verse 10 it says that believers will be given peace Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam wa yahdi man yasha'u ila suratim mustaqim So oh, okay darus daris salam the 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 nation of peace something like that So we see this idea Islam means submission so we are to as far as the purpose of life goes it seems that we are separated from Allah but we must submit to him we must serve him and then through that we get to spend eternity with him in So the only correction that I would say is is not about separated from God we are created and the purpose of our you know being created is to serve and to worship and submit to God yeah so that that part is correct the abode of peace experiencing peace and joy with him so from that I think a definition for the purpose of life in Islam would be this the purpose of life in Islam seems to be that we should submit to and serve God and through that we will enjoy peace with him for all of eternity Again, peace with him. That's quite interesting in the sense of, you know, it's it's from Christian perspective we are being with God. I'm not saying it's wrong, uh, technically or fundamentally, but the verse itself is not saying with God. With God is basically uh, because that's not the verse itself. Right? Uh, you will enjoy peace. You will be given, you know, the the pleasure of peace, etc. That's correct. Now, if you think this is a fair definition, let me know. Um, I'm sure you guys have some sort of, like, if someone asked you what's the, what's the purpose of life in Islam, I'm sure there's like a clear answer that um, that all Muslims recite. Maybe there's a clear verse that you guys go to. To, to it, that will be Surah 56, right? وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Basically, the same point. Uh, Allah did not create وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ Jinn and humankind إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ except for submission. Uh, and obedient towards God, basically. Describe what the purpose of life is. Um, if so, let me know. The equivalent of this in Christianity is, is basically this. To compare this with the purpose of life in Christianity, um, if you ask a Christian what is the purpose of life, or if you ask me what the purpose of life is, I think biblically the purpose of life is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Which, I see a lot of consistencies here with Islam and with Christianity, right? Same idea of... So, I think the, the, the idea that he have, and it's subconsciously imposed to the verse of the Quran is to enjoy him forever right so um, only worship one God you're supposed to serve him submit to him glorify him and then the end goal would be some sort of heaven enjoying him knowing him um, and so in Christianity the purpose of life is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever and um, yeah so what is the purpose of life in Islam how would you put it in the, in the most clearest and succinct manner other than that uh, in Surah 10 Yunus Yunus uh, the, the second thing that stuck out to me was basically the test of immutability. 
the test of imitability. I think in Sura 2, I talked about this idea, but I wanted to ask you guys, what is your thoughts on the test of imitability? And I'll break down why I think this test is, is intriguing, but I'm still also trying to figure out how would I know that the Quran is the word of God? And so I want to talk about some of the tests like this one. One verse in the Surah 1015, it says, bring a Quran other than this or alter it. Say, it is not for me to alter it of my own accord. So of course, the Meccan idolaters, they're challenging Muhammad and they're saying um, that he should just change the Quran or do it again because the Quran was disagreeing with their idolatrous beliefs. And so his response shows that he isn't the author of the Quran. Um, Muhammad says, well, it's not for me to change the Quran. Of course, what he's saying there is, it's not up to me to change the Quran because I'm not the author of it. Allah is the author of it. So the claim here and the claim of Islam is that Allah, or excuse me, is that the Quran is the word of God, is directly from God, directly his word. And then another verse, verse 38. Or do they say he has fabricated it? Say, this is the challenge, this is the test. Then bring a surah like it and call upon whomsoever you can apart from God if you are truthful. So the challenge here, the, the test of imitability, as it is called, is that, well, if you don't think the Quran is, is from God, or if you're not um, impressed with its beauty, with its order, with its eloquence, then how about you create something like it? And the idea here is that, well, you can't create something like it, therefore it's from God. Something so powerful, so amazing, so beautiful must be from God. A question I have, the question I've always had about the, the test of imitability, this idea of create a sort of like it is, well, there's not really clear criteria for this. If I was actually going to accept this challenge and try to create a surah like it, well, what does that even mean? Like it in what way? Like word for word like it um, in a similar rhythm? Does this just mean write something as beautiful? So let, let, let me share my honest thoughts about this idea. My initial thoughts about this idea is that the test of imitability and to say that you should produce a surah like it and if you can't, then the Quran must be from God. It's very, very subjective. And this is one of the problems I have with this test. It's incredibly subjective because it's all about, well, look at how beautiful the Quran is, how eloquent the Quran is. The problem is that's subjective. Art, for the most part, is subjective. I do think beauty is objective, but we have these subjective perceptions and opinions on what, what is beautiful. For example, I think, I think Narnia is beautiful. I think the Harry Potter books are beautiful. I think there's beautiful literature everywhere. So even if I conclude that the Quran is beautiful, which I admit, I do think the Quran is beautiful in some ways, but that doesn't mean it's from God, right? Beauty doesn't mean automatically from God. I would say truth does, um, but this idea of create a surah like it that, that is as beautiful and eloquent, I can say that about a ton of books. In fact, I know a lot of Christians who have read the Bible and specifically who have read the Gospels about Jesus and they're like, this is it. This is from God. I'm going to become a Christian now because of how beautiful this story is, because of how beautiful Jesus is. I have to worship him. He's that beautiful. Okay, so this is interesting in the sense that, um, of course, to be fair for a non- Arab speaker uh, approaching the Quran so we can only see the message the content the story etc uh, we, we do not have the capacity to understand uh, the linguistic part of it right and the challenge here so I, I think it's quite interesting this challenge because some Muslim bring forth this challenge everywhere to every single non-Muslim and it have it it, it's context now for every prophet that is being given miracle that miracle is straight away understood by the audience that because they, they understand especially the the expert of the time right the the the, the magician of the pharaoh or the pharaoh right they are the master they are the kings they're, they're pharaoh's magician they are the best in the whole land in magic and then when moses is being uh, told by god to you know uh, through his his shaft, right? His 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 shaft. What 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 do you call that in in, in English? And then it, it turned into snake, etc. They recognize this as a miracle. This is no longer magic. This is beyond magic. This is from the divine. They recognize that. The expert of the time recognized that. Uh, similarly with uh, parting of the sea, etc. So we can see the same pattern in the Quran of of the stories of the prophets where the people, sh the exp especially the expert of the time, should not have any more argument to deny this is from the div divine. Similarly, with when the Quran came down, Allah, the qadar, by the qadar of Allah, by the, the, the decision of Allah, it is to the tribe or to the people that have this um, culture of poetry, etc. Right? So, th they do not really have the tradition of writing 
it's 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 you know you know it's it's verbal it's listening etc right so that's the 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 highest of technology at that time and then when prophet muhammad sallallahu recite the quran many of the experts of the time recognize this this is beyond poetry right so that aspect of it uh, i think some of those who became muslim after learning the language of arabic and then go into the topic uh, i think they are the best that can explain this um, I, I, i can just relay the, the concept but i cannot relay the miracle if you understand what i mean right um, yeah so that's that's basically of course so when this challenge is put in context then it's 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 easier to understand but if it bring force out of context then we can discuss this kind of discussion throughout the night and we we do not have a meeting point because it seems abstract it seems you know arbitrary it seems uh, subjective as he mentioned to be fair so the problem is we can't all just sit around and say well my book's beautiful and well my book's beautiful and well my book's beautiful because i could say the same thing to you i could say create something like the gospels create something like the life of jesus you can't therefore jesus is god and you should worship him but of course that that, that wouldn't be a good argument it's it's very subjective there's a bunch of b- beautiful books out there we need something more also you might already be thinking this i know that this test in context this test is toward arabic speakers it's a challenge for arabic speakers to produce something like the sura and the quran because the quran is in arabic so i totally understand that but of course Again, that means this test will never convince me. This will never help me understand if the Quran is the word of God or not because I don't speak Arabic. So, does that mean I just throw this test out the window because I'll never be able to imitate it because I will never be able to speak Arabic or, you know, for the next 10 years of my life I could potentially learn Arabic, but that's a lot of work just to understand if the Quran is maybe from God or not. I think that's a problem. Yeah, so to this point, I think I I do agree to a certain, you know, extent with him in the sense that if i challenge him you know produce surah like that like this uh, and if you cannot make, be be muslim etc it's not a fair challenge because allah did not make this challenge worldwide it's to this specific audience that is resisting the truth in the time of prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam right so that's the context so that that's why there are muslim other muslim that see in the current context we have the technological advancement we have the scientific discoveries etc hence the dig up the this aspect in the Quran that if you you match the scientific discoveries which should not be able to be told or how to say understood etc 1400 years ago hence that's the miracle side of it etc so this uh, there's a different angle to to this the discussion about how do you test the quran is indeed from allah so not only is this test of immutability not only is it subjective but it's also limited it's limited in that it only applies to people who speak arabic and of course throughout the series i'm reading an english translation of the quran and so a lot of people are like well you're not actually reading the quran you're reading a translation of it okay why would allah reveal the quran in one language that a small percentage of the world actually speaks that means his revelation is really limited that means this test is incredibly limited and so okay yeah i think i have mentioned that earlier right it's not meant the test is not meant to be understood as a worldwide challenge to non arabic speaker as well but the message because we we cannot confuse the two issue the message the understanding um uh, it can be understood from any translation right hence there are many people that actually become muslim by reading just the translation they they couldn't see the miracle the linguistic miracle but the message itself is profound enough so that's another angle right so we we can do not confuse the two just because this specific miracle is in term of linguistic the message message can still be understood in english translation or other any other translation so i'm sitting here and i'm like how do i know that the quran is the word of god but i don't even have access to the true quran because i don't speak arabic so to me uh knowing that the quran is the word of god or not it just seems very limited like it's like i don't have access to know if it is from god or not because i don't speak arabic the last thing i would say is this again the question is overall what are your thoughts on the test of immutability do you think this is a good test 
am I am I am I saying it correctly? Like, is it about beauty and eloquence? You just have to produce something like it in Arabic. Do you agree that it only applies to Arabic speakers? Do you think this is impossible? Like, what's the criteria for it imitating surahs? Lastly, I will say this though: the thing that would convince me that the Quran is the word of God is truth. Beauty would not convince me, but truth would convince me. So if I come to a place where I look at the Quran and I'm like, it is correct. The Quran is just true in everything it says. It's true in its claims. It's closer to the truth than Christianity, to Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. That would convince me. Beauty wouldn't. I don't think this test of imitability would. But what would convince me that the Quran is the word of God is potentially its truth claims. And if I felt that the truth claims were accurate, which of course is one of the reasons. That's interesting. And hopefully we will reach the surah where... Hmm. Because some of the, uh, even the scientific discoveries, right? Some of the, the discussion about scientific discoveries is only understood when you understood the language, the Arabic language. Because many of those, you might miss it in the translation. We will see whether he pick up on those when we reach the surah. Reasons why I'm doing this series, Christian Reads the Quran, because I want truth and I'm pursuing it and uh, having a good time. Oh, my series is online. Stop listening to me, Siri. What are you doing? Anyway. All right. Uh, surah 11. Let's move on. Surah 11 to Hood. Hood. Sorry. Hood is, I think, the better pronunciation. Surah 11, Hood. So Hood, I was curious because uh, Yunus was Jonah and the next one is Joseph. Hood, I'd never Hood, I'd, I'd never hood of before. That was, that, was, that was an accidental pun right there. <laughs> uh, I had never heard of this prophet. So in Christian, in Christianity and in Judaism, we don't believe that Hood is a prophet. Never heard of him. But then he pops up in this surah. So in this surah, it's from the early Meccan period. Uh, it talks about Hood from verses 50 to 60. And overall, this surah is supposed to be an encouragement to the prophet, to Muhammad. Uh, this was early in the movement, so Muhammad was probably discouraged. His followers might have been discouraged. But this surah sort of encourages him in his movement because it talks about all of the prophets that came before him um, in Islam. And so it talks about, and eventually it talks about Hood. So echoing what I was what I was just saying a second ago this is probably this is my biggest question overall throughout the series and it will be moving forward I'm guessing but based on or bouncing off of the last point that I just made why do you think the Quran is the word of God why do you think the Quran is the word of God the reason I ask that with this is because this is the tension that keeps arising in me when I'm reading the Quran I'll read something in the Quran like about the prophet Hood here surah 11 and I'm like, I've, I've never heard of him. We don't see him in the Bible. We don't see him in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are some arguments that like, maybe he was Eber in the Old Testament, but it doesn't seem like there's much backing with that. So overall, it doesn't seem like Hud is in um, the Old Testament or the New Testament. But then you read about him in the Quran. And so this is the tension that, that dwells within me. Or if you wanna know what my thought process here, this is what happens. I read about this in the Quran. I read about Hud in the Quran. I don't see him in the Bible. And so basically, if I don't think the Quran is the word of God, then I'm gonna reject Hood as a prophet. But if I do think the Quran is the word of God, then I'll accept Hood as a prophet because the Quran talks about it. But from a historical standpoint or an evidential standpoint, I don't see him in the Bible. I don't see him talk about in Torah, which is the earliest sources we have for, for, the, for these ideas and for these prophets. That's an interesting way of evidence. Right? One is the assumption that, you know, the Bible is, is accurate in the history. Second, that it records every single prophet. Because that seems to be the foundation of this, this question, right? Therefore, I'm going to reject Hood as a prophet. But if the Quran is the word of God, then yeah, I'll accept what it says. So the tension that, that keeps arising in me is, I read something in the Quran, I don't see it elsewhere, I should reject it, but if the Quran is the word of God, then I will accept it. That's the difference. It's a difference in presupposition. If it is the word of God, then I'll accept what it talks about in every single way. If it's not the word of God, then I won't accept these ideas that I don't see elsewhere. In principle, that is how I see it as well. Meaning, the only reason why I accept everything in the Quran because I'm convinced it is the word of God. And why I don't accept the Bible because it's not the word of God, basically. Uh, and vice versa, versa, I would assume for a Christian, although the Bible is not actually the word of God, but Christian believe it is the message of God, right? So again and again and again, it keeps coming back to this question, which is the most important question for me, at least. Why do you think the Quran is the word of God? My, my question to him is the same question about the Bible. Whether, why do he think it is truly 
from God or endorsed by God? You know, why? What's the criteria? What convinced you that the Quran is, is the word of God? What about it do you think is the most convincing uh, that has led you to the conclusion that it is from God without a doubt? All right, and last but not least, let's move on to Surah 12, Yusuf. Yusuf, Yusuf, Yusuf. Um, story Yusuf. of Joseph. So, I actually really enjoyed this surah, maybe out of all the other surahs that I've read, because I love the story of Joseph. Joseph is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. Uh, he's in the book of Genesis, and his story is found there. Um, now here, in this retelling of the life of Joseph and, his, and in his story, there are some differences in this in, in the Quranic account in Surah 12 and between the Bible um, and Genesis. But again, that just comes down to presupposition. Is the Quran the word of God? Then I will accept and listen to what it says about the story of Joseph. But if it's not, then I'll listen to what the Bible says about the story of Joseph because I believe the Bible uh, is the word of God. So it's just a difference of presupposition. But overall, I still enjoyed the story of Joseph. I love the story of Joseph. There were a lot of consistencies. It's the main central narrative of his life. So I just wanted to end the video with asking, what is your biggest takeaway of the story from the story of Joseph? What is your biggest takeaway? For me, the biggest takeaway from the story of Joseph is to be patient in the present. To be patient in whatever present moment that you are in, whatever present moment that I am in. I love this idea. When you see the, when you see the story of Joseph, he has this dream, he has this calling when he's younger, and he's sort of restless for it. He, he wants to step into it, but then he gets thrown into a pit. He ends up in Potiphar's house. He ends up in prison for a while. And then eventually he ends up in the palace and is living in the calling that God had for him and showed him when he was younger. But I love this understanding because when Joseph first saw the calling when he was younger, when God first gave him the dream when he was younger, Joseph wasn't ready for it. He wasn't ready for the, this position in the palace. He wasn't mature enough. He wasn't humble enough. But then there's all of He wasn't humble enough? these seasons in his life that sharpened him and made him ready for that calling and made him ready for the palace. And so here, I think the lesson that, that sticks out to me is to be patient in the present, right? God is shaping me. He's preparing me. He's making me stronger. He's making me uh, more humble. He's making me more joyful so that I'm ready for whatever is next in life. And that just really encourages me and it gives me patience uh, in, my, in my present season, in my present moment. But what is your biggest takeaway from the story of Joseph? I would love to hear it. All right, with that being said, this video, a little bit long. Okay, so yeah, um, what he said there makes me wonder about two things. One is, what is the similarity and what is the differences between the story of Yusuf or Joseph in the Bible and in the Quran? Meaning that because what he said about the, the dream, thrown in the pit, etc., 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 and um, um, locked down in the jail, etc., right? Is it all, are all, are, are all those things the, the parallel between the story in the Quran and the Bible? While what is the difference then? Meaning, you know, is it just minute details or there are, you know, arc of the story that is actually fundamentally different than I'm, what I'm interested in? Second, because he talked about prophet, uh, prophethood before, um, which is different, existing in one and non existing in another uh, text, um, and then story of Joseph. Um, I'm interested when we come to certain prophets later on where the story because what he said is if one is the word of God and one is not he will accept the one that is being told by the word of God I'm interested to see when we come to the prophets that the story is very different in, in Quran and the Bible especially when the story in the Bible have you know like a character issue major character issue with with the figure right where in the quran they are the best of the people right so it's very different character wise i'm interested to see his view when we come to those prophets longer than i wanted it to be that's okay uh if you're enjoying the series please drop a like it means the world and please subscribe to the channel um, maybe through this video the next couple we can hit 4,000 subs that would be so cool and again I'm super appreciative uh, appreciative of you if you're still in this journey um, if you're still engaging with these ideas I, I still think this is a really fun journey um, Christianity and Islam have so much influence and for us to, to know each other's religions better and to pursue truth together I think it's a really cool venture to go on so all right so just to leave a comment All right, so that's the comment. Anyway, so that's it. Um, I will search for my comment and his response in the previous video in episode three. Um, and that would be the next video after this. So until then, see you next time.